We've had a couple of weeks off, and uh, we're going to finish up on uh, God's covenant with creation. And what we had uh, looked at uh, was in God's covenant with creation is verse 25, thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with the day and the night and the fixed laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob. It's good to note here that uh, this begins in verse 20, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night. Can you do that? Yeah. And uh, we know, we'll talk about miracles as we get uh, into this a little bit, but it is uh, important to know that God's covenant with uh, creation is broken by him several times whenever there's a miracle. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the law of gravity, the fixed laws of heaven and earth. The law of gravity is one of those. And we know that Jesus walked on water. He broke that law because he was supreme over it. And we'll see in John 1, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1 that uh, he was actively a part of creation, that things were created through him, and that he is supreme over all things. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky shows his handiwork. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they proclaim knowledge. And it goes out, that speech goes out to the ends of the world, and it's in all languages. Have you ever thought of creation as a revelation from God? Night after night, it reveals knowledge. You know, if we can look at the night sky and marvel at what God's created, we can know God through his creation. And the vastness of uh, the universe that he has uh, created is, is really amazing. Um, our first revelation that's meant from God that's mentioned in uh, Psalm 19 is God's revelation of creation. And if we were to pick up in verse 7, we would find out that uh, his second revelation is the Word. We can't know everything we need to know about God from creation. But creation is complete. We really like Romans 1, don't we? Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is God's power to salvation for all who believe the Jew first and then the Gentile. From the gospel, a righteousness is revealed from heaven. Uh, and that uh, righteousness is uh, from faith and for faith. And we love that uh, the righteousness that God has provided for us but if we were to pick up in verse 18, um, we turn from the love of God to the wrath of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they are without excuse. If we can't marvel at God's creation, there is no excuse for us 
And if we marvel at God's creation, that's what leads us to seek Him. And it's real clear here that, well, it says clearly perceived, and it goes out to all the, all the world. It speaks in every language. So let's look at invisible qualities, eternal power, divine nature. For us to know God, well, let's look at it this way. Knowing God is proportional to our ability to marvel at what he created and see his invisible qualities, his divine nature, and his eternal power. In fact, I think that's one of the first things that we want to teach our children is to marvel at the things that God has created. You know, I think sometimes we think, well, you know, we've, we've got a, a two-year-old. How are, we, how are they going to see God and know God? And strangely, they sometimes get it better than we do. And uh, it's, it's really, that's really where we began with uh, children for them to be able to see God and know God is to marvel at the things that, uh, that God has created. Well, I didn't do that right. So let's, th let's look at uh, a few things here, knowing God through creation. Uh, what did God say that we could know about him through what he has created in Matthew 6? Yes, be anxious for nothing. Thanks. Yeah, he takes care of the, the birds of the air. He says, you don't need to be anxious. Look at the birds. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store up in barns. But you can know that I have your interest at heart and I'll care for you. Every time you see a bird, do you think of God's faithfulness to you? Do you think about it every time you have a meal? that God provides. And birds are kind of unique. Uh, we have, when, when you see the, the dove, that's, that's really the epitome of peace, isn't it? You look at the doves and you see uh, they're never squabbling. They're always peacefully just side by side eating. You see, the, we've, we have the hummingbirds and they just... Uh, play chase all day, all day long, uh, just like they're playing tag. And I'm always impressed with uh, the woodpecker. I mean, man, wouldn't it be just easier to go pick one of the bugs or the worms up off the ground? Why do they have shock absorbers in their head? And have you ever gone up to uh, try to get close to a Woodpecker, they always go to the back side of the tree, don't they? Yeah. And when they fly, they'll flap their wings. It's kind of undulating their flight pattern. And it's just, it's, uh, as we marvel at, uh, you know, the woodpecker with shock absorbers in his head getting the grub worms out of the trees, uh, you know, why does that happen, right? God had a purpose for that, and I think he had a joy in creating the woodpecker. I, I love to work with wood, and uh, I'm really blessed because uh, Nathan's allowed me to work his sawmill and trade for wood. And I've, Every time I turn a bowl with Bodark, I'm, I never know what it's going to look like. You can plan as much as you want to, 
But as you start cutting that bowl, you'll end up with a little thread you'll see, you know, coming out. And there, it's always, uh, Bodark, for some reason, always has uh, carpenter ants in it. And uh, you'll find little pockets of carpenter ants, and uh, when they're spinning up at 1,200 RPM, they come out a little dizzy sometimes. So uh, and it's just marvelous to see some of the things that God uh, created. Uh, the birds came along in, in day three, didn't they? in the fish. So we'll, we'll look at some of that. Uh, God said we can know him by looking at the birds and the flowers. And I love, uh, I love to see a field covered with uh, crimson clover or with uh, the blue bonnets. It's just marvelous to see uh, the beauty of the things that God has created and we need to stop and take time to look at the, the beauty of that. Oh, this is a good one. You know, we, we spent a lot of time in John 3. The wind. Man, I know when uh, Hurricane Ike came through, that was an adjustment, and we... <laughs> Trees were blowing over, and uh, I think I lost 14 or 15 elm trees. One of them snapped at the top and hit the pole, the power pole. I've got a couple of poles back to the house and pulled the electrical out of the house. And I had uh, gone out that night just for a little while, what I could stand just to, you know, see what was going on and listen to it. And the power of wind is, is amazing. And there isn't anywhere it can't go when it's blowing at those speeds. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's a life and death statement, isn't it? That one is born of... That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel at I say to you, you must be born again. The, bl the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You born of the Spirit? You have the power of the wind. I think if we were to try to unravel the depth of that, I think it would take us uh, a really long time. And as we look at uh, the wind, you see the effects of the wind, it's invisible, but we can sure see what it's doing, can't we? We can sure see the effect of it. And there needs to be an effect that's seen from our life when we're born again and we're led by the Spirit because we're children of God. We have uh, the parable of the sower. I think so many times uh, as we look through the Bible, um, it is often the um, physical that God uses or that Jesus used uh, to help us see spiritual things. It's often, uh, if we look at the parable of the sower, uh, we see uh, the sower who went out to sow the seeds and some fell on good soil and some on rocky soil. The lost sheep... Uh, You've been compared to a sheep. That's part of creation, isn't it? Uh, and we see the love that God had for the one lost sheep. Miracles. I think when we look at uh, God's covenants, we see several times that uh, God has 
interrupted the uh, laws of physics, the laws of nature, to be able to uh, perform a miracle. I think the one that gives us uh, a really clear picture of physical versus spiritual is the healing of the paralytic in Luke chapter 5. It's really clear because when he was let down through the roof in front of Christ, what was the first thing Jesus said? Your sins are forgiven. What does that look like? Can you see it? What does a forgiven sin look like? Invisible qualities, invisible attributes, divine nature who can forgive sins, but God? Boy, that got the Pharisees' attention, didn't it? They snapped to attention and said, only God can forgive sins. And the pity is that they didn't know that they were in the presence of God. I think Luke uh, 5.24 really puts it in perspective because Jesus said, so you can know for certain that I have the power to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, get up and walk. At that time, limbs that had been atrophied were fully healed. That's a miracle. That supreme power over all of the natural laws that we have. I mean, yes, we have medicine, but that's not a miracle because you're using it's it's a slow healing that goes along with uh, your God-given ability to to heal. But when we look at uh, miracles and we look at the well, Jesus calming the storm. Oh, mercy. Boy, that would a hurricane comes through. I, all of y'all have probably been through a hurricane. I mean, I can't stay here very long without getting hit with one. Can you imagine calming that? That's his divine power, his eternal power, his divine nature. And all of that is uh, through creation. Probably should go ahead and touch on God's second revelation to us, although it's not uh, really a part of the covenant of creation. But it's uh, important that we know that we can't know everything there is about God. We can't know what God expects of us in all cases from our knowledge. his children, and especially what pleases him and displeases him, we will have to uh, spend some time in his word. And so when we look at knowing God, we spoke of knowing God through our, our knowing God, eternal power, knowing God, is proportional to our marveling at what he's created. And when we get over to uh, God's word, we find that knowing what pleases God and what displeases God is going to be proportional to the time that we spend in God's word.
And if you went over to John 1, which revelation actually came first. So, God's word, we can f- see how, how, how we can be his God, what, what, how we can be his child, what pleases God, what displeases him, his purpose for you, his pattern. So I think, uh, I think I'd like to go through uh, John 1 because when we think about uh, creation, uh, well, let's, let's, let's run through creation real quickly. In the beginning, God... We don't ever hear that, do we? It's always in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God, where was he? And so I've asked this before, different lessons, but I think it's really important for us to note that although we can see God through all that he has created, God is eternal. And... God does not just exist within the universe as we know it, okay? God is spirit, and those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, And it's important for us to not see God encapsulated with the universe that he created. Are we good with that? Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And we're going to find in John 1 that as God designed and spoke the universe into being, it was Jesus Christ who fabricated all that God spoke into being, Nothing was made that has been made without him. Uh, remember John 1.14. Uh, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Word there is, means logo, is word logos. It means revelation from God. So as we look at uh, John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were created by him, and there was nothing that was made that has been made without him. And in him is light, and that light, in him is life, and that life is the light of the world. And we see on day one that God created light. Is light a particle or a wave? What's the laws that govern light? Well, there's been arguments about that, but it's considered both a particle and a wave. And that, that wave form determines uh, the different spectrums that we can see. And uh, as we look at light, we have uh, photons. Uh, what... Why do you think light was created before day three? Well, photosynthesis. Wouldn't it be nice that the plants on day three would have light? So God created light. Now when we look at, uh, at, at light, we have a wavelength, anything smaller than that. Wavelength. Well, there we go. What did I do? Nothing. Uh, Anything smaller than that wavelength is not going to be visible by the eye. So uh, there are a lot of things that we know exist but are invisible to the to the eye through a microscope, which is why we have electronic microscopes. 
uh, the One hundred eighty-six thousand miles per second. What's that? I'm gonna see if I can kick this back off. Two, four, five, seven. Yeah, that's kind of unfathomable, isn't it? Uh, the conclusion is that uh, there isn't any object that can travel light faster than the speed of, speed of light. And of course we marvel at that because if we see a, uh, the sun setting and it uh, actually goes over the, over the peak in the west, it actually went over eight minutes and 17 seconds before, right? So all that God has, uh, has created is uh, something that we can really marvel at. Uh, the second day God created, uh, separated uh, <clears throat> the earth from the atmosphere and the heavens above. And then on day... Three, he separated the land uh, from the waters and uh, created uh, all of the vegetation. So all of the vegetation at that point uh, on day three. And um, we have all of the vegetation, the plants, the seed-bearing fruit trees. And God saw that it was good. On the fourth day, uh, God set all of the set the earth in orbit around the sun, lit the sun. And uh, when we think about uh, those orbits and the seasons and the tides and Gravity, it's really amazing that all of that uh, is set in place. I think, uh, you know, back in the 16, 1700s, uh, scientists really uh, focused on science to, so that they could know God. Um, that was their search for God. In fact, uh, Newton, who I think we all look to as far as uh, an understanding of gravity. Uh, he spent as much time writing uh, about uh, biblical things uh, as he did writing about uh, gravity. Um, he was really fascinated with uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But as uh, we look at that, we see uh, the elliptical orbits we see all of the things that uh, are set in place. Uh, it's actually marvelous. If, we, if gravity were a, a little bit stronger, uh, the universe would collapse in on itself. If it was a little bit weaker, we'd fly off. Yeah, we could fly off the earth. I've been to, I've had to work in Australia before and there's an up and a down. And uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's uh, pretty impressive that uh, you know the every particle, every everything has an attraction to everything else, and it's proportional to the mass and the the distance. So when you look at that, and uh, it's it's really something we marvel at. And we talk about the Hubble spacecraft sometimes. Well, Hubble was the one that. Uh, he and his crew were the ones that determined that we have an expanding universe. Uh, that uh, 
as you look off into the distance, uh, you see that uh, the universe is actually expanding. Well, that's going to be a whole lot better than collapsing in on itself, isn't it? So uh, when you look at all of the things that had to occur to uh, create, to be in place for creation, it's really something that we can, can marvel. And the fifth day he created uh, the woodpeckers and the fish and uh, the birds and the fish. And then on the sixth day he created all of the livestock and the beasts and the, living, the creatures that live on the earth and uh, man. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And when we look at God's pattern here, uh, he created male and female. And today, uh, there are so many that uh, are even confused as far as why they have a, whether they have a Y chromosome or not. Um, so God created uh, man in his image. We've already touched on John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it or comprehend it. When we look at creation and we know that God the Father spoke the universe into being, we know that God the Spirit was hovering over the waters, and we know that God the Son was active in fabricating the universe that we live in. I like the light shines in the darkness. Uh, what are some of the things we know about light? We, we've already talked about we know it has a wavelength. I think the important thing is it has a p power source. Darkness is an emptiness. Light has a power source. And light exposes So when we look at uh, creation from the standpoint of light, it is important for us to understand the spiritual aspect of it. And uh, if we were to look at Ephesians uh, 5, probably about verses 8 and following, it says that we are to walk as children of light. Light references righteousness. Uh, if you look at those verses in Ephesians 5, you see that it uh, references darkness and, and uh, along with unrighteousness, and we know that light is referenced along with righteousness. So spiritually, light is the presence of God. And we are to walk as children of light, and it goes on to say that we're to have nothing to do with un fruitful uh, works of, of evil, unrighteousness, but rather we are to expose it. And so the darker the world is, the brighter we should be. And when we look at uh, walking in the light, that's John 1's really beautiful, isn't it? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and blood of Christ continually cleanses us of our sins. We're to walk as children of light, righteous. When we walk righteous, then our life is holy.
Here's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, whether thrones, dominions, powers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Why were you created? <clears throat> what were the last two words we read? For him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, the atom, the neutrons, protons, and electrons, or the planets in their orbits. All of that holds together because of Christ. So when we look at uh, the universe that was fabricated by Christ, we see that in him all things hold together. And then there is uh, verse 18 through 20 discusses uh, the spiritual aspect of Christ as head of the body, the church, the reconciliation that we have in him, uh, the power that he has over uh, Satan and death. You're going to notice uh, the similarities. You're going to find, hopefully, you'll see that Genesis 1, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1 all have a, a common thread, which is the supremacy of Christ through creation and uh, the forgiveness that we have through him. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Doesn't that sound like Colossians 1, that all things hold together through him? You see how this uh, gives us another take on it, upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And <clears throat> you think about uh, John 1.14, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Uh, would you leave heaven for somebody else? Yeah, that's uh, John fifteen thirteen, isn't it? No greater love has anyone than he give his life for his friends. Um, you think about uh, all that started when he chose to leave heaven. Uh, that's kind of Ephesians 1, when the uh, fullness of time came. But Ephesians 1 also tells us that uh, before time can, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit knew that there was a way that if man sinned that we could be brought back to him, and that was through the Son. And I'm going to try to do this real quickly because I don't think we have a lot of time, but something came up last week. I'm uh, Not last week. Uh, the last time we, we were going through this class about uh, uh, Babylon and the, uh, well, about the covenant. Uh, and if we, you probably can't uh, see this, Zedekiah, uh, just trying to put this a little bit into context because someone brought it up. Uh, and so as we, as we look at uh, Jeremiah down here, we see that uh, <clears throat> he spans uh, the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And uh, we know that the northern ten tribes had already been... Uh, had had already been had already 
gone into exile and did not exist any, anymore. So the last king that existed uh, in Judah was Zedekiah. And what was God's promise to David? Well, let's just look at Zedekiah. He, he, he was, uh, we had uh, a couple of years uh, siege on Jerusalem. Uh, they, were, they were starving. Uh, Zedekiah had his eyes poked, punched out. He was dispo- deposed as king. Uh, the people of um, the people of Judah were taken captivity, and in fact, what's the most quoted verse in uh, Jeremiah? The most quoted verse is uh, is going to be verse uh, twenty nine, eleven, I think. Well, maybe not. I know my plans for you, plans to prosper and plans to succeed. Let's just put that in perspective. Jeremiah 3, uh, Jeremiah is telling Israel that you have gone after other gods and prostituted yourself again to other gods. And uh, so we have the whole chapter of uh, Jeremiah 3 that is talking about their apostasy. Then we get over to chapter uh, 13, and we see that Jeremiah's crying his eyes out because they won't repent. And then we get over to Jeremiah 25, and we find that God says, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. And uh, he has uh, taken captive. What a brutal king he was. Uh, it was a brutal captivity. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, they were devoted to destruction... And then we, it's kind of interesting, we get over to chapter 29, and God says, I know my plans for you. Know, we see, I know my plans for you. You know, plans for you to prosper, plans for you to succeed. Well, that whole chapter is about uh, the Babylonian captivity, captors uh, listening to false prophets were telling them that they were going to be able to go home soon. And Jeremiah sent them a letter and that letter said, uh, build houses, get married, survive if you can, because you're there for 70 years, and you're probably not going to ever see your homeland again. But I have plans for you to succeed and prosper. So let's put that verse in context, because uh, Jeremiah is saying, this is... Uh, where you're going to spend the rest of your life is in captivity, and uh, you have uh, really abandoned abandoned God. Well, that was the last king uh, of Judah. They posed, and his eyes were put out. So, what was the question that Judah had? What about Second Samuel seven? God promised David that there would be an everlasting covenant. What about that? Well, then we come to chapter 31, and that's where we read God, through Jeremiah, said, a new covenant I will establish. It won't be like the old one. It'll be like the new one. And what was the cost of that new covenant? Yeah, it's going to be Matthew 26, probably about verse 28. You know, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for many. That was the cost of that new covenant. And was God true to his uh, covenant with uh, Israel, with David, that there would be someone on the throne, that it would be an everlasting throne? Yes. And who's there now? The root of David, the line of Judah, Jesus Christ, and that we talked about in Ephesians 1, uh, was uh, when the time was right, God sent his son. You know, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. And that was God's plan from before creation. And so, as we look at this, uh, it helps us to put this in perspective uh, when God is saying, 
if you can break my covenant with the day and the night, if you can break my covenant with the fixed laws of heaven and earth, uh, then you could stop Jesus Christ from coming and being on the throne because that's the prosper and success that is being discussed in uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. God bless you. Thank you for staying with me.